have a pretty good friend from college who uh, he's actually even been here before, came up, him and his brothers, and ministered with us. And actually, the guy that I'm going to talk about for a second, he actually came with uh, his dad uh, at one point, and they uh, got to know him a little bit. But anyway, about four or five years ago, he became a reality star on an MTV show. Now, I've never seen the show before, but I was following him on Instagram, The Sun, and just watching over the last couple of years before I quit following him because it got so raunchy, honestly, that how he started out to be one person, and then over the years as fame and pressure and really, I guess, who he truly is began to come out, that it became, again, so bad that I just quit following him. And he, he, I, I found this comment that he made this in an interview that he did, and he said this. He said, I'm, a part, I'm part of a very small southern Christian type town, he said. The fact that I got put on this party show where I'm drinking and hooking up, I got a lot of backlash from where I'm from. My family was getting a lot of heckle from it. And he went on to talk about how that, you know, he just kind of changed to be something that, he, you know, that he wasn't before. And just watching his transition over the years on this and, and just watching this identity crisis that was going on with him, who a, a guy who was from a fairly solid family, at least from a theological point of view, knew the right truth. And I think we all can struggle with our identity, with who we are and what defines us. And maybe ours isn't quite as dramatic a shift as this guy is or was and is, but ours are based on our jobs, our finances, our successes, our grades, our academic achievements, our sports achievements, our appearances. All these things can become so important to our identity that it replaces our primary identity, which is who we are in Christ. And the way we notice this and the way we see this and we see how important these things are to us is when we lose something, when something that we value is taking away, how do we respond to that? When, we, when something that once was so important to us and then it comes into crisis and where we experience failure or we're burned out in our job or our health begins to deteriorate, how do we respond? The very foundation of our identity can be shaken and then we have to look around for something else to redefine who we are. And what I love about today's text is as we look at John the Baptist, as the Apostle John begins to talk again about John the Baptist, is the fact that he saw himself as truly, I'm the voice. I mean, that's how he refers to himself. I'm the voice. Now, John is a huge personality. He's a charismatic individual. But I think he realized, I mean, I know he realized that what his place was and who his identity was in and what his identity was in, and therefore he could rely upon that and it didn't have to be about him. And I think that's, as, as we're going through this text today, I hope you'll connect that to your own life. What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word that wakes us up from our spiritual slumber. God, it helps us to identify and remove the idols in our lives, things that we base our identity and so much of our um, beliefs in, although we can say oftentimes that these things aren't near as important as you, the reality of our life, we follow the trail of our time, our treasure, our, our abilities, our talents. We, we see that they lead to just us in command of our life rather than you sitting on the throne of our life. And God, I pray that we'll learn from John the Baptist that we can be who you created us to be but we can decrease and you can increase. And may that be our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been tracking with us the last few weeks, the Gospel of John has been very theological up to this point. John's laying down the identity of who Jesus is. Jesus is God. This is critical. God became flesh. The Word became flesh. But it's important to realize also that Jesus is distinct from God the Father. 
And this is the Trinity. And if you've ever looked through your Bible trying to find a definition of the Trinity or a verse that says this is the Trinity, you won't find it. I love this chart that will be up on the screen in a second because I think this helps us understand the Trinity and so we don't misspeak or say things that aren't accurate. And so we see that Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. But the Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Son is God. And it's important, and you may think, well, I don't understand, because so many people try to articulate the Trinity and do so in a way that's really not truthful to Scripture. And so it's important that we at least, in such a concept that's very hard to wrap wrap our brains around, maybe never fully understand for sure until eternity, but we at least can be aware of the fact that we can easily get off of, of into error if we're not careful. One, this is bonus, not in my notes, but modalism is a belief that God used to be, I mean, God was God the Father, then in Jesus' life he became the Son, and now he's in the Holy Spirit, but you don't see the connection between the three, and we have three and one. And so Jesus is God. God came to earth, unbelievable. I mean, just fathom that for a second. God came to earth, the Word became flesh, And so we understand that Jesus is going to relate to his Father, his Heavenly Father. They're both, they are equally God, but yet they relate to each other as Father and Son. And so the Word became flesh. And we've talked about how John's purpose in this writing is to convince others to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so we turn kind of to the narrative now of the book. John's going to walk through Jesus' life and things that happened. And so he returns to John the Baptist, this powerful, radical, bold, and popular prophet and preacher. And John makes it clear, again, right off the bat here, that he's not the guy. He's not the Messiah, verse 19 and 20. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And the Jews were anticipating the Messiah. Again, we walked through this 400 years of silence since the last prophet. Since Malachi spoke, 400 years where God had not spoken to his people. And all these promises and all these biblical prophecies, and they looked around and they saw how awful things were in their land, the land that was God's land. God had given them this land, yet the Romans, these Gentiles, were occupying the land and controlling their lives. And they longed for the day when they would return to the prominence of David and Solomon. And here John shows up, and John is from a priestly family, well-respected, and priests are respected to be advocates, spokespeople for God. John's from that lineage. And so when he starts preaching and he starts baptizing, there's this buzz and there's this excitement. And so the Jews send priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? What's the deal? What's going on here? Who are you, John? Are you, are you the guy? Now, it's interesting, in the book of John, every time that he uses the word, the term Jews, it's always a negative, all right? These are the people who put Jesus to death. These are the religious establishment of the days. So this is not the nationality, it's not ethnic. When John uses this term, which is almost 70 times in his gospel, it's always used to identify the enemies of Jesus. And so the religious establishment, they want to know what's going on. And they want to determine who this guy John is who's preaching with such power and authority. So he flat out says, I'm not the guy you're looking for, the Messiah. I'm not him. And then verse 21, they try to guess again. Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Now, John was this nomad. He's this guy who came out of the desert. Here he is. Uh, he's got hair all over him. More than likely, he was what's called a Nazarite. He'd taken the Nazarite vow. And so part of that, you don't cut any hair on your body. And you don't drink any alcohol. And so you got this guy who's pretty much looking like a wild man, been in the desert, been in the wilderness, and he comes out and he's easily identifiable because he does look, and his appearance looks this way. And it's reminiscent of the description of Elijah from the Old Testament, this rugged appearance. And so it's a good guess, are you Elijah? And a few weeks ago, we talked about Malachi and the prophecy that Malachi made that in the end, that as the Messiah is preparing to come, that he would send Elijah the prophet to restore 
the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And so this was a, pre, a, a forerunner to Jesus. And interestingly enough, that they knew that, you know, Elijah never died. He was taken up in this chariot of fire. And so he was right, it made sense that he would come back to earth. And so when they saw John and they heard him speaking, they knew these prophecies, then they maybe thought this is literally Elijah returning in fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy. And they were partially right, but he's not Elijah. He clearly says, I'm not Elijah. He was an Elijah-like figure, and he was who Malachi had prophesied about, but he wasn't actually Elijah. And the Gospel of Mark begins by declaring that John the Baptist was this messenger, so it takes the guesswork out, out of it. We know from Matthew and Mark, Matthew chapter 11, verse 13 and 14, for all the prophets in the law, Jesus said, prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. But John doesn't want the fanfare. He doesn't want the attention. So he clearly states, I'm not Elijah. I'm not the Elijah you think I am. And so they try again. He says, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. What is this about? The, the prophet. Moses had prophesied and predicted way back in Deuteronomy that there would be this specific prophet who would come at the end times, that the time the Messiah would arrive. And so the Jews distinguished this end time prophet from the Messiah. It was going to be the same person, but John again wanted to completely shut off speculation that he was a fulfillment of this end time prophet, so he simply answered, no, I'm not that person either. And so they finally give up their 20 questions, and they just say, who are you then? We need to go give an answer to those who sent us, to these Jews, to the religious establishment. Who do you say you are about yourself? And so John finally gets to the answer of it, and he says, look, I'm the voice, verse 23, just a voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So he refused to identify himself as some end-time figure, but don't get this wrong, that he was anybody other than just a normal first-century preacher or rabbi. And he quotes Isaiah chapter 40, which is in the book of Isaiah. This is a pivotal spot in, this, in Isaiah where the prophet had been predicting judgment and prophecies of God's wrath coming. Then all of a sudden in chapter 40, there's this turn, and it begins to give prophecies of deliverance and he begins to give prophecies of the good news that's going to happen and the picture here that John the Baptist is painting is of a king who is about to arrive and kings during that time would have a messenger go on ahead of them and announce the way and say the king is coming make straight the way the king is coming and there's so much prophecy here that I won't get into today in relation to this Isaiah 40 but the bottom line is, John says, I'm just this person announcing the arrival of the king, all right? I'm a nobody, but I'm prophesying, I'm, I'm predicting, I'm announcing, I'm loaning my voice here, I'm giving my voice for the somebody who's coming behind me. And I'm just a tool in God's hand pointing to the king that's on the horizon. And so he's not the prophet, he's not Messiah, he's not Elijah, he says, I'm just the voice I'm the messenger. I'm the messenger. Never seen the show, The Voice, but when this title of the sermon, when I was reading the text some weeks ago, and this kind of jumped out at me, I knew there was a TV show called The Voice, and apparently, some of y'all correct me if I'm wrong, but apparently at least part of the time, um, the, the judges don't see the person who's actually auditioning and singing to win. They have their backs turned, and the person's singing, and then when they like what they hear, they hit the button, and they turn around to see who the singer is. And, and I love that kind of that picture here that we have of John the Baptist. Although he is this big personality, like I said, it doesn't matter who he is, because he's pointing to someone so much greater that he might as well conceal his identity, because his purpose, just like yours and mine, is to take what we have and use it to announce Jesus Christ. And look how they respond in verse 24 when he tells them, I'm just the voice. It says, now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, then if you're just this voice, you're, you're not any special, why are you baptizing? If you're neither the Christ, nor Elijah, 
nor the prophet. And baptisms could only be performed by a prophet or a religious authority at this time. And in Judaism, baptism was about converting a Gentile into the faith of, of Judaism. And so a, a Gentile proselyte would be, go through baptism and he would be converted. That would be part of his conversion. But John's baptism appears to be unique because it seems from the text that he's baptizing Jewish people. And so his activity is going on around the Jordan area, a Jordan River area there. And he's attracting a lot of attention as he's baptizing Jewish people. And he's saying, repent, renounce the evil of your ways. And then he immerses them in water. And then they're reclothed as members of this professing, I'm going to observe the law. I'm going to observe God's commands. But just like baptism today, just like when we do baptism here, baptism here in the church, baptism in and of itself does nothing to wash the heart or make you right or pure or righteous. Baptism simply is an external pi- picture of the internal repentance that goes on. It's an outward sign of cleansing that's, that's happened within as we repent from our sins and we look to Jesus. And so this repenting and turning to God was an internal thing, but it was displayed, illustrated through baptism, which is significant, not making light. Baptism's a huge deal. Let me just pause and say this. If you've never been baptized, then I encourage you to do so. If you've never made that public profession of faith in Christ, you say, well, I'm just a kind of a private person, and you know, I, I've, I've trusted Jesus. Jesus is my Savior, but I just don't want to, to draw that attention to myself. But here's the thing to remember. That's your first act of obedience. And if you stumble in the very first act of obedience, I believe you're going to continue to stumble all along the way. Jesus says, hey, be baptized. And so if you've not been baptized, I encourage you to be baptized to show that external picture of that internal repentance that's gone on. And so John says his baptism is designed to prepare people for the coming of Jesus, the main attraction. Again, over and over again, just deflects the attention from himself and puts it back on Jesus. And Jesus, by this text here, in this point in the text, appears to be relatively unknown, that people don't know who Jesus is. And and so verse 26, look, John answers him, I baptize with water, but among you, somebody out there in the crowd, some of you that are just watching me do this and listening to me, but among you stands one you do not know. And so he's saying, hey, it's not time yet to reveal his identity. That's coming, but right now his identity is concealed. And it's interesting, Jesus and John both are probably about 30 years old at this time. And what's interesting, we know about the birth of Jesus, we know about the birth of John, and then Jesus, we know at 12 years old, we have the story in Luke where he goes to the temple but really, we have about an 18-year gap where Jesus, we don't, we don't know anything. And there's wild speculation out there that Jesus was in India and Japan and other places, crazy stuff. But, but where was Jesus at during that time period? We don't know, but we do know, more than likely, he was in Nazareth in this obscure Galilean town, working as a carpenter, living an obedient life to his parents, doing all the things that a normal Jewish boy would do at that point. But at this point, it's unknown. He's unknown. And John's been unknown. And I would, you know, have so many questions I would love to have answered about Jesus' life during that time period, right? When I was a younger man thinking about, I wonder how Jesus responded, you know, when he was hammering that nail and hit his finger. I mean, did he, did he, did he hurt? Did he, oh, that, oh, that's terrible. You know, how did he respond? What was his reactions like? That? Those are gaps that we don't know. But John clearly understood the greatness of Jesus, and he understood it because the Holy Spirit was going to reveal that to him because Jesus and John, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, were related. They were cousins. Verse 27, he, again, he notes to Jesus' greatness. Here he says, there's this guy standing out here among the crowd. There's a guy that you don't know who he is yet, but even he who comes after me, Jesus coming after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He's saying, I'm so insignificant that this, the, the, the lowly servant of the household, the job that he would do, that's the job I need to do for this guy. I'm not, or I'm not even worthy to do that job. 
to go and untie the feet of the master, the shoes of the master, and take them off his feet. He says, unworthy to do that. But here's John, this popular preacher, and he knows his place. He knows that he's a servant. What a great reminder for us. I'm a servant, a servant of the Most High King. And that gives me significance and identity, but I don't need to search for me. I search for Jesus. And as I pursue Jesus, then he helps me in those areas where I struggle with putting my identity in stuff that is meaningless, it's going to fade away. I have a pastor who's, I know a pastor who's sort of an acquaintance of mine. And interestingly enough that you look on his social media Twitter feed and he has like thousands and thousands of followers. And uh, all right, forgive me for a moment in the flesh here probably, but I, I go in and I begin to look through his followers and there's like, so many like bogus followers, and 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 I, and I did a little research, and I found out that you can like buy Twitter followers. All right, if, so if you want to up your level of influence and personality, and be mo- more known, you can buy these packages in order, you know, pay X amount of dollar, and we guarantee you fifty thousand or fi- five thousand new followers. And and it appears that's what this guy ha- has done. Because why? Even pastors. Even elders and religious leaders and deacons, we can love the spotlight. We can love the attention. And and here's the thing that's tricky about it. We justify it. Well, if it gives me a bigger platform, then, you know, it's, it's a good thing, right? It takes humility. It takes constantly being at the feet of Jesus in order to not to allow us and our personalities to begin to usurp Jesus. And all of a sudden, what used to be, or maybe at one time was, me using all the gifts and the uniqueness that he created me in order to lift him up, all of a sudden I reverse that and it's more about me. And usually that happens when we begin to fall away from our time with God, our prayer life, is non-existent or it's, it's meaningless. The word, we just do it to check it off our lists. And we lose sight of the greatness of God and who he truly is. And when we allow that to happen, we say, God, you're not as big as I thought you once were. wouldn't say that, but my life is illustrating that. So therefore, I'm not finding my significance this way, so I need to look for it this way. So you guys will send me love. And so I find my significance by the things that I do and the way that you respond or the power and control I have over your life or the comfort that you allow to bring into my life. And so we allow these these rude idols and these, these gods to begin to control our identity versus Jesus, you're in control of my identity. And that happens so easy and so quickly. It takes some really, for some of you, it's going to take some really deep soul searching because it's gone on for so long that you kind of don't even know anymore. And the Holy Spirit has to reveal that to you. You know, I constantly remind myself because I'm guilty and I'm tempted just like you are. Of Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. I'm preaching the gospel to myself who loved me and gave himself for me. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I have the Holy Spirit in my life. I read this quote from all people, a guy named Mark Driscoll who I actually enjoy listening to. He's had his troubles over the years as a pastor. He said, sadly, as religious people often do, they read the Bible looking for ways to be the hero of their own life rather than reading it to see themselves as villains and Jesus as their hero. That's the way we should read the Bible. A sinner, unworthy, condemned, The wrath of God is on me, except, but 
for the grace of God. But for the grace of God. And that's found this gospel-soaked humility that in and of myself, I stand under the wrath of God if it wasn't for Jesus and his righteousness imputed or given to me, this, what the theologian called this alien righteousness, something that's not from us. It's from him and is given to us. And in that, Romans 3, we now stand before God, not based on what we do, but what he has done for us. That's where we find our identity. And that's where we say, I no longer live. I'm living and I'm the tool and the instrument, the ambassador for the gospel, but I no longer live. He's living through me. And so this life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And John was a picture of that. And John concludes this little section. He says, these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where Jesus was baptizing. Interestingly enough, most people who wanted prominence and attention would begin where? In Jerusalem. If a general wanted to make himself known in a power move, he would go to Jerusalem, the capital, the place where you know, the, the, the big movers and shakers were. But Jesus didn't begin his ministry in Jerusalem around the temple. He starts it in this little obscure area. And he works his way to Jerusalem, and we know what happens in Jerusalem. Ultimately, he's put to death when the time is right. But up to this point, John has been talking about referencing and referencing and mentioning Jesus. He's been alluding to him. He's like, he's, he's among you. He's out there. But now he moves into the next section. He moves to actually identifying Jesus. And John's going to use everything that he is in his personality to point people to Jesus. So verse 29, he says, the next day. So the next day here, and probably Jesus' baptism, John doesn't say this, all the other gospels at this point have given the narrative of Jesus' baptism. John doesn't directly say that, but this happened here. So the next day, after the Pharisee delegation has come to question him and left, that he now, that he sees Jesus coming toward him. John sees it. He's coming, and now it's time to make Jesus known. Behold, verse 29, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I've said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. So he points Jesus out. And, and, and we cannot really grasp the significance of John's declaration here. Because at the time, to think that John would actually point to somebody and say, this guy right here, who you don't even know who he is, he's going to take away the sins of the world. I mean, it would be so in the face of the religious leaders of the time to say this is the Lamb of God. And the picture there is the sacrifice of the Lamb as the substitute or as the atonement for sin, as we see in the Old Testament, beginning back with Abraham and throughout and in Leviticus, a lamb was prescribed as the guilt offering for sin. And so the title Lamb of God here is pointed toward Jesus. And Jesus is shown as the one who would take away the sin of the world. Verse 30, he's going to take away, verse, the second half of 30, who takes away the sin of the world. So the Holy Spirit revealed this amazing truth to John. John didn't get this on his own. It was done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 31, I myself did not know him. But for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed in Israel. So John says, I didn't know this. This was revealed to me. And when did the Holy Spirit reveal to him? Look at verse 32 and 33. Not until the Holy Spirit gave him this revelation through Jesus' baptism, most likely. He says, verse 32, and John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. And we know that from the other Gospels, the, the dove descended. But here's the thing, it remained on him. So it's more than just a dove descending upon Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus and remaining on him. Verse 33, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize the Father with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John makes it clear. The Holy Spirit just, just didn't come on Jesus 
and rest there for a few minutes or an hour or a day and then take off. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus and remained upon Jesus. John says that twice. He remained upon Jesus. Why is that significant? It's not significant to us because we know the Holy Spirit lives within all of us. That's what the Scripture tells us. Here's why it's significant. And you may have forgotten this. I pointed this out over the years. Throughout the whole t- Old Testament, you look back through the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon someone. The Holy Spirit would come on Moses and empower him. The Holy Spirit would come upon Elijah or upon Gideon. It would clothe Gideon with, with the Holy Spirit. He came upon Samson. He came and, 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 and fell upon David, upon Elijah. The Holy Spirit came upon all of these people in the Old Testament, these amazing figures, but the Holy Spirit did not remain on any of them. Nowhere in the Old Testament will you find the Holy Spirit permanently indwelling anyone. But Isaiah predicted that the Messiah would be full of the Spirit at all times. Look this up later, Isaiah 11.2, Isaiah 61.1, and then look in also Luke 4.18. And so the Holy Spirit not only came upon Jesus, he indwelt Jesus. He resided with Jesus permanently. And the New Testament, this is what's amazing. The New Testament makes it clear, as I said, that New Testament believers, we have the Holy Spirit in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. So think about that for a second. Do we really think that's possible, that we could have more power on our lives permanently than Elijah? than Moses, than Isaiah, who the Holy Spirit came to David and then left David. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave you if you're a believer. If your faith is in Jesus, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave you. Now, there's different levels of walking in the Spirit. The power of the Spirit can live through different people at different degrees. Scripture teaches that. But the Spirit is there to convict, to teach to instruct, to guide. And so I look at my own life and I think, why am I so weak when the Holy Spirit is in me and the potential there is so strong? Why does the Holy Spirit not do some of the great things that he did through those Old Testament people who just had the power on him and then he left? Scripture tells us Christ in you, the hope of glory, changes everything. And John identifies Christ plainly here the second time. He says, this person that the Holy Spirit resides upon and is in, verse 34, I have seen and have borne witness that this is, and this only came from Jesus, and from God for Jesus. This could only be given to John by God. He was the Son of God, the Son of God. The Son of God. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and the Son of God. The Holy Spirit revealed that. So, wrapping this up today. A lot lot of text. Key takeaways, I think, are plain and simple. Jesus is the hero. John knew that. He lived that way. Just the voice. So what do we do in response? Ask God to reveal more of himself to you. Get a bigger view of God and the Holy Spirit that resides in you. And when we pray, pray and say, Holy Spirit, let me walk in your power today. Don't raise your hand, but how many have prayed that? Any time in the last week, two weeks, two years, Holy Spirit, let me walk in your power and strength today. Fill me with the words of Jesus. Fill me with the passion that only the Holy Spirit can bring. Ask God to reveal more of himself to you. And then hands, be a voice in the manner in which God has uniquely gifted you. God has given you either you're an introvert, you're an extrovert, you're a guy who makes it happen, you're a lady who has great influence around those you are around and those who you befriend, you have status in the community, you have wealth, 
whatever God has given to you and the personality that he's allowed you to have and the experiences that he's given to you. Use those to be a voice and constantly pray, I need to decrease so you can increase. Use my passion. Use my boldness. Use my shyness. Use my insecurities for you and for your glory. Make me a voice for you. John the Baptist, what, a, what an amazing example. Let's let that stick in our head this, this week. Jesus is the hero, not us. We're the zero. We really are. We're nothing without him. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this story that we have from Scripture that just tells us about your life, Jesus. It tells us about how that you were announced and how you came to this earth and you took on flesh. And God, that you, Jesus, you sacrificed yourself for our sins. And Father, I pray for your people, your church. Help us to remember these amazing truths and help us to be more of a voice for you in the small ways and the big ways, in the daily motions, the thousand little decisions and interactions we have during the day. God, allow these times to be times where we're the voice to point to you. And nobody needs to see us. They need to see you living through us. Teach us what that means and what that looks like. Help us to be filled with your spirit. Give us power over sin. Power over our own weaknesses of the flesh. And God, help us to walk in a way that serves as ambassador for your name and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.